Oh my gosh. What a great group. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on, on where you are. Uh, my name is Shalini Upu. I am Director of Admission here at Reed College, and it is our total pleasure to be with you today on Friday, uh, coming at you from, from our living rooms to, to yours or wherever you might be, uh, safely at home, working at home, or studying from home. And today you're in for a treat if you're joining us. Thank you so very much for making the, the time to, to learn about Reed, to learn about our approach to liberal arts education, uh, and to hear directly from the stars of the show, our, our faculty. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Professor Rourke, our professor of economics at Reed, and also Professor Chris Koski in our political science and environmental studies department. Before I do, uh, just a quick favor for everyone in this room, because there are so many of you and that's so exciting and I'm sure you've got great questions. If you wouldn't mind directly chatting to me, privately chatting your questions to me, uh, and then I'll make sure that I pass them on to, uh, to the professors. And speaking of passing on to the professors, uh, I'll turn it over to Chris and John, take it away. Oh, well, hello. Well, hello. hello. Um, my name is Chris Koski. I'm uh, Shalani just said I'm the um, political science department. I'm a member of the political science department. I'm also in the environmental studies program. I'll talk a little bit more about those programs in a bit, but I'm going to pass it off to John. Yep, and I'm John Rourke. I'm a professor in the economics department. Um, I have been here 10 years now. It seems always amazing when I, when I make that number that big. Mm -hmm. um, we're a department of eight, and we can kind of go through kind of the econ major in a little bit. But since Chris is doing two majors and I'm only doing one, I'm going to let him go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, we are a department that is also, I think we are seven now in political science and the environmental studies program has uh, uh, five faculty affiliated with it. Um, the political science department at Reed is in many ways similar to other political science departments in the sense that we cover the kinds of subfields that you'd be used to, things like American politics, um, things like comparative politics, international relations, American government, and public policy. We have faculty members that specialize in each one of those. Um, one uh, feature about the Reed curriculum that is, I think, distinct from, well, there are many distinct features, but from a, a programmatic perspective, the political theory is uh, a big chunk of our, our curriculum, so we have three folks that do that. Um, the political science department is one that focuses, has essentially about, I'd say, half empirical folks, half theory folks. We have people that are interested in large quantitative studies. We have people that are interested in qualitative case studies, ethnographies, things like this. And then we also have folks that are interested in um, political theory, uh, in uh, sort of engaging in the major sort of phil political philosophers of the time. Um, the program is one that it does have some building associated with it. That is to say it has, you know, some core courses like American government or introduction to comparative politics or introduction to international relations, political theory. Um, but then after that, students really have an opportunity to um, really dive down into the areas of specialization for each of the faculty. So for example, most of what I teach is related to public policy or environmental policy. Paul Gronke in our department is one of the of nation's experts on early voting and also voting uh, voting by mail, which is an issue right now. It's it's huge, and so his phone is ringing off the hook. Um, we uh, Mariella Schwartzberg, Deb, Debbie is somebody who works with um, Latin American politics and comparative politics. Peter Steinberger works in theory, so does um, Tamara um, Tamara Metz, um, and and Darius Rajali works on uh, a number of things like well, torture. He's not torturous, by the way. He just happens to research torture. It's an odd department in some ways. We have people that work on marriage as well as people that work on torture, at least in the political theory realm. Um, so um, it's not a judgment of any kind in either one of those things. It just sort of happens to be. Um, and finally, Alex Montgomery works on um, uh, international relations and in particular works on things like, you know, nuclear proliferation and the like. So our major is one that uh, where students have an opportunity to engage in research with all of our faculty. Most of our faculty, um, I'd say almost all of our faculty have published with people. I'd happily answer more questions about um, uh, the kinds of research that we engage in, but more specifically, I mentioned already early voting. I work on state and local politics um, and those kinds of things. So move, I'll transition then to environmental studies, which is um, a program read. It's highly interdisciplinary, which is to say, that each of the faculty members in that program have appointments in 
environmental studies, but also have appointments in a, a home department. So for example, I'm a political scientist, but I'm also in environmental studies. Julie Fry in chemistry is an atmospheric chemist, and she's also, so she's in the chemistry department as well as environmental studies. Aaron Ramirez in biology, um, biology and environmental studies, and Noah Nedesel in econ economics, um, and then also uh, Josh Howe in history. Each of us have our own areas of expertise, but, but one thing we do sort of coordinate on in particular is the area of climate change. And so I, I study state and local climate activities. Julie Fry studies um, uh, the atmospheric chemistry affiliated with, with uh, greenhouse gases and other kinds of particulate emission. Uh, Josh Howe has studied, uh, has written a book about um, the history of global warming science and the policy that comes out of that. And Aaron Ramirez works specifically on um, areas related to, well, it works on trees, a lot of trees. He, he's sort of, we call him tree beard because, well, he's got a beard and he works on trees, but he uh, works on these things called climate refugia. And that's areas where, um, areas within habitats that actually might be more resilient to climate changes and trying to figure out how we can identify those for the purposes of protection. That program is one where the students um, uh, engage in a flavor of, of environmental studies. So you're an environmental studies major, but you specialize in one of the five areas, econ, history, political science, biology, or chemistry. You take, um, as you take uh, four to, uh, actually four to five units, depending on how you structure your major of natural sciences. If you're an HSA, if you're a, uh, uh, a non-science major, and if you're a science major, you take um, many units in the social, social sciences. We have two classes that are specifically interdisciplinary and introductory research methods course, which I teach with Julie Fry. Um, and then we have an, uh, a, Julie, a junior seminar course, which is project-based, again, where you have a, a natural scientist as well as a social scientist teaching together. And the idea really is to go beyond simply a multidisciplinary multi approach where you're taking a bunch of classes from different departments, but actually interacting with faculty that have integrated research agendas and then engaging in research with those faculty. And I could point you to some publications that we've produced, um, both either, either the publications we've produced with other faculty, but also with other students. Um, so those are the, I've talked about at least, you know, some of the areas of, of environmental studies. Um, uh, one other area of environmental studies, of course, we have an environmental studies econ major. And I think that John might be able to speak at least a little bit to that because he's, we've sort of roped him into teaching that occasionally. Um, but he also, uh, John and I uh, share a number of other research interests in common. And so, I'll, I'll pass it off to you, John. Yep. So I guess I'll talk about econ um, for a moment. Um, so like I said earlier, we're a department of eight. Um, and one of the things that that has been is we have grown. Um, when I came, I was number five. Um, and within 10 years, we've grown to eight. And part of that is because the department is just becoming um, a little more popular over time. Um, Within that, we kind of do a whole bunch of different things. So I teach all the theory courses, um, which sounds boring, um, but one of them is game theory, which has actually become one of the more popular majors or classes on campus, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but in the, my day-to-day -day sort of research thing, I'm a tax economist, and so I look at things about state and local taxation and try to figure out how, you know, why do states do certain tax policies the way they do? And I'm particularly interested in how people like move in response to those, where do they choose to live? Where do they choose to migrate? That sort of, those sort of questions. Um, Kim Clausing in my department, um, you may have heard of her because she has a book right now called Open, um, which is basically a, um, as she calls it, the progressive argument for free trade. Um, she was a little concerned about some of Bernie's arguments um, against free trade, and so she decided she needed to come out um, very strongly against this. You will see her doing a lot of things in Washington. Um, she knows a lot of the Oregon delegation, uh, so she's pretty active in, in that realm. Um, Chris already mentioned Noella. Um, she knows pretty much everybody in Portland. Um, in terms of government, I, I would say probably everybody, um, and I'm not lying. Um, she does things on floodplains locally, um, water usage. Um, she knows people who have done things on tree canopy and kind of tree canopy and housing values, um, other sorts of things like that. So she's really kind of tuned in um, into the city, and so there's a lot of opportunities there. Portland is a great city from an environmental study standpoint because we have some of the best data um, at the city level going in the entire country. And Noelle has access to all of it um, through her contacts. So we have two students doing thesis work this year who are working with the um, Department of Bureau, what is it, what's BPS? Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And they have access to all the housing data. And so they are trying to figure out, trying to build a model with the city on predicting which houses are going to be knocked down next for infill. 
Um, and so that's been really exciting. So they, their thesis is actually working with the city to give the city something that they actually want to use in the end, which is really amazing. So Noel has all these sort of interesting contexts. Um, Nick Wilson does interesting things because he does more of uh, randomized control experiments, which is a new thing um, in econ. He works on Africa and he works on um, healthcare and trying to figure out different sort of ways to kind of get people to kind of take care of health. So he primarily focuses on AIDS, uh, prevention of AIDS in, in Southern Africa. Um, and he does a lot of experimental work there trying to get people to kind of be more, you know, health, healthy and that sort of stuff. We have a bunch of other people working on China. We have people working on behavioral economics, which is a really interesting sort of subfield where econ and kind of psychology come together. Um, so we have a lot of activity there. Um, so we're, we're a pretty active department and we're pretty kind of doing stuff that's, um, in the mainstream at the moment, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's just an interesting time to be either in poli sci or econ, quite frankly, because with everything going on, um, we're gonna be really interesting over the next couple of years, I think, both, both, both of us together. Um, the econ majors uh, is unique at Reed compared to a lot of places. So one of the things when you look at schools and you look at the course numbers, you'll notice that you'll get like a 100, 200, 300, 400, and that's pretty universal. The 100 is like intro, like welcome as a, you, you know nothing about this field, um, come right in, it's kind of your intro course. So you'll see a lot of that in like, you know, math 111 here, which is intro calculus or intro to languages are all math, you know, Latin 110 or whatever, something like that. The 200 level tends to be for sophomores and then the 300, 400 level tends to be for juniors and seniors. Well, in most econ programs, we have an intro micro class and then an intro macro class. And what happens with those classes is that there's a lot of repetition between them because we have no way of telling which one you take first. So we kind of let you take macro or micro. And what we discovered as Reed is that you get bored really quickly with those. So we don't do that. So our intro is at a 200 level. So our intro econ is econ 201. It is a combination intermediate micro at other places combined with about three weeks of intro macro. And then what that does is our entire major after that is what we call flat. It is all in the 300 level. So what that does is you take intro with us and then all of a sudden the rest of econ is open to you. So rather than having to wait a year and a half before you can get into the interesting stuff, you take one course and then you're in, you're in and you get to do all the fun stuff, um, which is a lot more kind of, I think, exciting. Um, the way we teach intro, yeah, I, I, I threw out the word intermediate micro, which means it's at a higher level, but we also know kind of who we're teaching to in terms of, in terms of we have a lot of non-majors who take that course. So it's very easy for non-majors to come in and kind of take econ. And there's a lot of cross fertilization that also happens between econ and poly. Um, it, it's something to kind of keep in mind that a lot of poli sci students end up taking econ as one of their divisional requirements. The econ students often take poli sci. A lot of my students end up taking Chris's courses. Chris's courses end up taking, students end up taking mine. Um, so there's a lot of kind of econ poly kind of working together. And for a lot of courses, um, you know, I teach a course on public finance once in a while, um, which is economics of the government. It's, a, it's where it's half poli sci, half econ. So we, we kind of have these courses where they merge. So there's a lot of space in our field courses where non-majors come into play, but there's also enough space for the majors to kind of be able to do what they want. So it, it's kind of an interesting sort of thing. But because we're flat, once you take that intro course, you're in. And you can basically do all the interesting stuff and you don't get stuck having to do kind of some of the more boring sort of stuff for a while or, or a longer term. Um, I like to mention thesis a little bit only because in econ, um, and I think this is true in poly, you get a range of what you can do. Thesis is this kind of capstone kind of achievement at Reed. It's a big, it's a big deal. Um, and I just want to give you a sense of what my students are doing this year just to kind of say how crazy they are. So I've got one who's working on um, trying to predict gentrification by neighborhood in Portland. I've got one who's looking at the role of taxation and crime. Um, I've got one who is looking at taxation and commuting patterns. Sounds a little boring, but he managed to, it's a massive data of work, which is um, great. And the real interesting one that I, I like to throw out here, and if you've been to one of these other ones that I've done for econ, um, you'll hear this one. But we have a video game thesis where I have somebody who is basically creating a virtual economy for loot boxes and trying to see, so loot boxes are things that you can buy in video games. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big gamer. Um, but essentially what he's able to do is like, if you know the probabilities of getting good loot as opposed to bad loot, does that change your behavior and whether or not you're willing to buy these boxes? Um, in the past, I've had somebody do one for Team Fortress 2. Um, <laughs> we had to buy hats or something and replicate that. She turned that into a job at Riot Games. And now her role is actually to run the entire eSports um, division of Riot Games for Asia, Australia, and um, Latin America. Excuse me. 
So thesis can be really broad in terms of what the topic is, and econ is really flexible in terms of what you do with that. Um, so you can go kind of in any directions you want. Um, and I can give you all sorts of other topics if you want to hear more interesting sort of things that, you know, that don't involve me, um, but nonetheless, that's there. Um, ES econ is something that has been growing. I think ES in general has been growing a lot. Um, and, and Chris and Julie and Noel and, and everybody else has done a really good job of making that program um, really viable and really vibrant. And it, it, it's growing into something that, that is great. I'm kind of a secondary affiliate with the program. So some of my courses in public finance or urban economics um, have an environmental component. Um, so I help out, it counts towards the major. When somebody's on leave, I kind of hop on and onto the committee, um, things like that. But I, I'm considered secondary, but I know enough about ES to be dangerous, um, is what I like to say. Um, so we can help with that. We have probably three or four a year who are doing Econ ES, and that's growing. Um, and so I, I anticipate by the time you all show up, we'll have like six or seven in a year. Put that in perspective, we have you know, 30 majors total. So ES is becoming a bigger and bigger component of what, of what we do. And it, and it makes sense because between Noel and me and Kim, you've got three people who do public finance, which means we have interesting relationships on, on, the, on the government side. So ES is becoming a thing. If anybody's interested in ICPS, I'm also kind of secondary person on ICPS. So I can also talk about that if that's something of interest to anybody. But if it's not of interest to anybody, um, I won't bother. But just fire over to Shalini that you want to actually hear about ICPS. And I can kind of do the 30 second spiel on that later. Um, I'm trying to think. Let me talk about one other thing in econ too. Uh, well, I guess I'll lie. Let me talk about two other things in econ. Um, first thing is, is um, parents always want to know at the end of this, like, what are you going to do when you're done with econ? And so I thought I'd give you a little bit of a uh, kind of history on kind of how we're doing. So we have students who obviously want to go and do, you know, PhDs and that sort of stuff. So we're, we're doing really well in that regard. In the past three years, we've sent people to Harvard, Yale, NYU, Caltech. Um, so that'll work. Um, and then for internships and things, we've been played, we do a good job. We have a research program, um, that works where every, where every faculty member can hire a student to do research with them over the summer, um, which has been really popular. Um, and then we have good placement. So I had somebody last year who was working as an intern at the Philadelphia Fed and turned that into a job. So she's going to go to Philadelphia next year. Um, we're really excited because Bain, um, the big management consulting group, has decided to kind of recruit on campus now. Um, they're opening an office in Seattle. It's a big deal because they only go to the IDs in like Stanford and Northwestern and now Reed. Um, so we're one of the few liberal arts colleges that they're actually going to be recruiting, recruiting on, which is, which is a big deal if you want to go that route. Um, but we have people doing all sorts of things. We have people working with the city. Um, we have people, we have one person who works on a chocolate farm. Um, and her job is to harvest organic chocolate for companies and then figure out how to sell it and what the, what the right way to market it and sell it and understand the numbers. Um, so we have a, a lot of, like, there's a wide range of stuff that you can do with econ, and, and, and so we have people placing um, all over the place and, and those sorts of things. And we can talk more about that if that's something you want to you wanna know more about. Um, the last thing I'm going to throw out there um, is to say econ, and I think Polly does this too, um, but in econ, one of the big things we believe in is kind of that you need to be kind of happy in your home in order to thrive in your major. And so we build a lot uh, of time doing kind of community sort of work in terms of building the major. And so we have this reputation on campus as being one big giant family. Um, and so to give you a, a, a couple of examples, my daughter, when she was younger, she's now 10. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got something stuck in my throat. Um, when she was little, she used to host a tea party every year. And it was a formal tea party that all the, all the students would come dressed up as, and then we'd have tea for the entire day at my house. She is now 10, and she has grown out of the tea party phase, but she has gone into exotic cheese as her thing instead. So there's a cheese bar in town that you can go to that has all cheese from all over the world. She really particularly enjoys tasting all the cheese. She thinks that's like a, a, her fun thing is like being an adult, like she gets to be pretend and taste all the cheese. And then she does this whole layout spread with meats and quince paste and the whole, you need crackers and the whole thing. She writes down all the cheeses, what country they're from, are they cow or this or whatever. And then all the students come over and usually we have about 25 or 30 students in my house eating cheese for a day. Um, it's a big giant spread. Um, so she loves doing that every year. Um, um, and you'll, you will know Tegan if you come to campus because she just she hosts everything and she just loves doing that sort of stuff. So you, you will meet her if you come. Um, we do a board gaming once a month. Um, 
for students who like to play board games. Um, it's another way of building community, um, so we do that. Um, we have a great rivalry with PoliSci in softball um, that happens every year. Um, PoliSci is usually better um, because their faculty are better than our faculty. Um, so we lose, but you know, PoliSci wins, um, but that's not a big deal. Um, and even right now, where you think like we're in this weird world where we're Zooming and everything, um, we have virtual happy hour every, every week um, with the econ majors, so that we're getting together, and I am actually hosting trivia night tonight um, from 4 to 5.30, so we're going to have a trivia competition every week for the rest of the semester, trying to see if they can actually um, answer my questions, uh, so we're going to be still doing stuff. Um, so we're, we're working hard on making sure of that, but, but it all comes from this general philosophy that if you are happy in your major and, you're ha and you have a place where you kind of feel like you, you belong, then, then you actually thrive in your major as well, and so we are very cognizant of that and try to work really hard at that. Um, have I left anything else, Chris? No, I, I think you've got, I mean, one other thing I would say that is, you know, thinking about uh, the overlap between political science and economics, we, we do get along, I think, quite well. I particularly find myself half in economics and half in political science, if for no other reason that I seem to be involved in every, every, uh, every search you all have. But um, I'm also in the, in the fall related to coursework that's overlapping. Kim Klausing, who wrote the book Open, which I was going to get, but I don't want to leave you. Um, and I are teaching a class on 2020, the politics and economics of 2020. And it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, just can tell you that right now is, it's, the course is, is, is writing itself as, as it goes along. So there are these really, these opportunities to um, engage from the perspective, of course, of keeping up with current events, but also applying economic and, and uh, political science theory to whatever sorts of policy positions emerge and we should be able to keep up not just through the election but then also what happens during um, transitions or what happens during a phase when there isn't a transition and there's a consolidation of power. Um, there were a couple of, of questions folks asked that I thought I would address broadly because the major is, Reed is, uh, one of the questions was about you know whether you, do, you double major in political science and in environmental studies for example and that gives us an opportunity to talk about a couple of things that are related to Reed. The first is the environmental studies program the major is environmental studies, and then there's a special specialization within that, and that would be political science, or economics, or history, or chemistry, or biology. Those are the five, as Keith Carroll, who is a biology professor here, and another affiliate of the program, arguably one of the starting members of the program, would call the five flavors of environmental studies. Um, Reed doesn't read a, a t sort, of, sort of like on paper allows for double majors. Uh, they are incredibly rare, and that's because uh, you are required to write a thesis in each of your majors, um, which sounds maybe like a, not a big deal right now, but once you get into the thesis process, <laughs> it's, it's a huge deal. No. So, yeah. <laughs> so John's saying no. Yeah, I've been here for not as long as John, close. Uh, I think I've been here for nine years. And um, I'll just always say nine years, by the way, just so that I don't end up with the 10 number. I don't want to have to deal with that. Uh, and I've seen exactly one, um, yeah. and that was Joseph Warren, if you recall, and he's going to graduate school in political science at Berkeley. He's getting a PhD there. So he's the kind of person that you might expect to do that. It's pretty rare. So, so for environmental studies, then, I mean, we, you'd see, you basically would make, you would major in one. Now the, the majors, the environmental studies flavors, concentrations are not the curriculum is essentially the same curriculum that you would take in your home department, usually minus one or two courses. And then on top of that, there is this uh, rigor of, you know, either in the case of the political science, economics, and history, it'd be the rigor of more natural sciences. And the reason why, we, and we've stuck to that, even though there's been some pressure to kind of go away, push away. We get students every year who come in and want to be ES majors, and then they realize, ah, I've got to take intro bio and intro chem, as well as an upper division um, uh, science course. Um, it is true that's hard. No question about it. But we've talked with um, people in the field. We've talked with graduate programs. We've talked with a lot, of, a lot of folks who are actually engaging in this kind of science policy nexus. And to have, you have to have some kind of proficiency with, in the case of, let's say, an ES political science major, you have to have some kind of proficiency with science, the scientific method, um, the language of science. And in the case of the environmental studies chem major, you have to have some proficiency with the, uh, being able to communicate with stakeholders, being able to talk with politicians, or being able to talk with people who are frankly not somebody who is really good at uh, in an MR, but actually can sort of figure out beyond that. And so our students, when they leave, um, they do they do a lot of things. I mean, this is the classic response from most read you know read responses. Uh, our students tend to do very creative and interesting things that are related to their majors. Um, 
we have uh, students have gone on to do think of course a lot of our students go to graduate school um, some go on to law school there was a student of mine a few years ago Marissa Hazel who wrote a thesis about um, who wrote a thesis about super fun cleanup on reservations and she talked to four different tribes and asked them about their relationship with the EPA because super fun is implemented by states or have or directly by the federal government in consultation with tribes those are distinct legal entities for the purposes of environmental policy she then, she graduated, she wrote the thesis, graduated, went to law school and, uh, and studied Indian and environmental law. And now she works for the Bureau of Indian Affairs as an environmental lawyer, right? That's a, that's a classic sort of transition from the research she was doing in environmental studies, in political, in environmental studies, political science specifically, and on her thesis. Another student, Alma Siolagi, who was an environmental studies history, history major, she and I wrote a paper where we looked at the the presence of adaptation policy, ad adaptation within um, climate action plans across 106 cities. She then got a, a master's in planning from Penn, and now she's a, a planning a, a planner in Philadelphia. Um, so those are the kinds of opportunities we see from our students who eventually go on to graduate, and a lot of that's a function of working with faculty members individually. But in, in addition to that, you know, similar to what John was describing with the Goldhammer program in another and other programs, other funded programs within an, uh, economics in order to fund student faculty collaborative research, the environmental studies program has something called the Environmental Studies Summer Experience or the ESSI. Um, and the ESSI program gives money to students who provide, a, you know, they, they have some kind of project, they usually are working with some kind of organization, they have a small budget associated with that project, and then they go off and do it. And often those projects become um, either parts of their thesis work. Sometimes it's a thing they just learn and they go away from it. Um, a good example, I mean, some of these essays are pretty pretty creative. Um, well, a good example would be many years ago, Rennie Myers went down to the Caribbean for three months and talked with people there about uh, if the impacts of climate change, which sounds like a, a vacation, and it probably kind of was, except that she did turn it into a Watson and did that around the world instead afterwards. So there are these, these programs within the college that can fund that kind of research we also have connections through Noel and through, um, arguably, I know some people too in political science. And so uh, we have connections through organizations like the Oregon League of Conservation Voters, which is a, an environmental organization. The League of Conservation Voters, Oregon was the first League of Conservation Voters in the country. Um, we've had students who've gone on to intern there um, and actually intern there and be paid by the SE to do so. We've also gone, had folks that have gone to work there. We've had folks that have worked for the Oregon Environmental Council, um, folks that have worked for Bonneville Power. Um, these are people that, you know, they're, they're putting their degree directly to use. So you even have, you know, you know, had a students gone on to, to Peace Corps, you even had a student, an ES chem major who went on to work for not a chocolate company, a cannabis firm here, which I know sounds like he went to work for a drug company, but like, well, that's a big industry in Oregon. So he worked, he worked, he worked to try to develop, um, you know, uh, I don't know what he was doing. Something with THC. Apparently, more of it's better, or something. I don't know anything about that. But at the end of the day, that's a, we have a lot of variation in terms of the kinds of paths that students can take while they're here, while they're doing their summer work, and eventually um, in employment. And the best part about all of this, and I'm sure John would agree, is that the students, all the all the careers that I've just described, which means we have alum in those in those opportunities in those positions, and so we can say, hey, listen, if you want a job in X field, why don't you talk to this person who has a direct connection with either John, me, or any other member of our departments? I mean, I guess I'll throw out one other thing too from the from. Um... There's a Center for Life Beyond Read is, for those of you, is a, a very big kind of collaborative effort between us, um, with Econ and us, uh, and, and the center. I think they work really closely with ES as well. Mm -hmm. um, Econ has a couple, has another program, which we, we call the Econ Summer Fellowship. And it's for Econ majors who decide that they want to do an internship, but they do it in a, get a, it's basically an unpaid internship. So a lot of it is for the nonprofit sort of work. Um, we have a lot of students who want to like work for the who or something. Um, and so we have a scholarship program in place that basically pays you for your unpaid scholar, unpaid internship to make sure that you're actually paid during it. Um, and that's a process that happens towards the end of the semester. Um, we can usually fund like three or four of those. Um, we usually fund about 10 or 11 research students a summer um, on average. And then the rest of ours are, are doing pretty well, kind of finding different sort of internship things. In the department, I am known as the resume destroyer. Um, that is one of my jobs. Um, and so I tell you to bring your resume to me and I destroy it and, and cover it in a pile of ink. And then you go back and fix it and then it's a heck of a lot better and it gets you in position to actually be able to kind of get the internships and things that you want. Um, so you will run into me one way or another and it is, 
for a while there, it had gotten so popular that all the majors in poly and physics and people I'd never met in my life um, would walk to my door and said, I hear you do resumes. Can you destroy this one for me? And so I, I started destroying random people's resumes as well. Um, I'm now doing um, graduate school applications for physics for some reason now. That seems to be the new thing that people are coming to me for. Um, but nonetheless, um, the double major thing that 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 is a thing that you, if you really have your heart set on it, then yes, it is something that you can do. Um, but usually the two thesis thing is what crushes you. Um, it, the thesis is a lot harder than you would think. Um, and as you get kind of into your junior and senior year, you kind of realize, oh yeah, this is a lot. Um, with econ, we've created an econ minor. So the read is starting to do minors. And so we have a minor, which is a, a five course sequence that you can do. And that allows you, if you want to major in something else, but have like econ as like a, another base, um, that gives you another opportunity to kind of do something like that. Um, there's also opportunities to do what we call ad hoc majors, which is I want to combine two fields into something. Um, so in the past, you know, econ has done all sorts of things before the minor. So we had like econ, this year we have econ art. Um, we had econ dance last year where somebody dances a profit function and tried to tell us that that was what, um, uh, uh, which was kind of interesting. We've done econ theater in the past, econ Russian, um, econ Chinese, um, they're, they're interesting, right? With the minor, we're hoping to kind of scale that back just a little bit to give you a little more flexibility. One of the weird things with the ad hoc major, well, not weird, but kind of difficult things is you've got two masters on the thesis. You have to make both departments happy. And sometimes what one department thinks of as a thesis is very different than what another department thinks of as a thesis. So the econ theater one, for example, theater always wants you to have performance. I don't know what that means. Um, in econ, like we can't perform a derivative, we can't perform a utility function. Uh, I don't know what a demand curve looks like when you make it artistic, um, but somehow we're performing. So it, it becomes a really interesting sort of weird sort of combination. In the end, they're really interesting in what they come out to be. Um, but it takes a lot of work to try to figure those things out, but the, those opportunities are there. Um, so let's see, a question came in. Typical career outcomes for students who graduate econ quantitative. Oh yes, I didn't talk about that. Thank you for triggering me on that. Um, so econ has two tracks. We have a traditional, I just want to be an econ person and I'm just going to do econ. Um, and then we have what's known as a quantitative econ focus. And basically that's the econ major with, I want to take some math classes. And so with the math classes, it's like basically intro calculus, multivariate calculus, linear algebra, and uh, an intro stats course, essentially. Um, that's more of a signal for graduate school people who want to be able to do that, so who want to kind of go to graduate school. There's usually more of a math component you need, um, and so we, we kind of have that. Grad school outcomes go all over the place, so we do have students who go straight to go for a PhD in econ, Econ has morphed into a world where you don't go straight from undergraduate anymore. You need to do a couple of years as a research assistant somewhere. So in the past couple of years, we've sent students to Chicago, to UCLA, and to the Stanford Graduate School of Business, um, which are Stanford and uh, Chicago are top five programs for econ, so that's, it's really good placements. Um, so we've been sending people um, in, in that route who want to go into grad school. Grad school has been a, a very good option for us consistently over time if you want to get your PhD. Um, if you don't want to do a PhD, um, we have a lot of students who go to law school, so similar to poli sci, we have a, a large selection there. And then we have a ton of students who do kind of interesting sort of either masters in public policy, and again, those are the students who have kind of crossed over between econ and poly and kind of like want to kind of keep in that middle ground. Um, the public policy major or masters is a, a good option. We have some students who get MA programs and all sorts of different things. We have somebody who's at the forestry program at Yale. Um, we have somebody else who's doing something at Duke. Um, so we have a, a lot of different sort of things and it's just a matter of you kind of thinking about what you wanted to do in that sort of way. Um, so that there's that. Um, careers are all over the place. Um, and like I said, I, I think I gave a little bit of, a, of an example by saying, you know, you can go from one end with the, the chocolate farmer um, to one end in management consulting. Um, but there's a whole realm of things in between. So I have one person whose job is to work with the city and what they do is they look at cost controls, which sounds incredibly boring, but they love it. Um, they think that's the best thing ever is to watch co cost overruns in the city. Um, and if you've ever seen a city revenue sort of system, um, you know there's a lot. Um, so they'll be busy for a very long time. Um, so they're doing that. I have, um, I had somebody who used to work for another gaming company. Um, we somehow have a really good gaming group connection, but they used to work for um, Pop Games, which used to do all sorts of little like 
cheapy sort of um, stuff that used to pop up on Yahoo and other sorts of things back in the day. Uh, so we have somebody working for that. Um, we have somebody who works for um, the New York Fed doing housing policy. We have somebody working for um, health policy. Um, so we have a lot of anything that really is like data oriented you'll have the ability if you do the quantitative econ track, you're going to get a lot of exposure to working with data that you're going to have a lot of opportunities being able to do so. And the one thing I will say is I just had a student get a job offer three days ago, which is pretty amazing considering what's going on right now. And they're going to be they're They're still looking and still getting interviews and still talking to people. So we're people know us. Um, and we, we have contacts with people and, and they know us really well. Um, Brookings and Urban Institute in DC is another one, the think tank groups. That's another place where both econ and poly both plays really well. And we have a pipeline that goes down there all the time. So the tax policy center in particular for us in econ, I think over the past six years, we've faced eight people there, um, which is pretty amazing because they only hire two a year. Uh, but we, they know what we do. We train them well and they know that. Um, somebody asked about opportunity to incorporate finance as a minor. So finance, um, at, a, at a place like Reed, we don't teach finance per se. But we have a course in behavioral finance, which is working like finance. So it's uh, Tristan Nicewander is teaching that course. It is a it is more about kind of the psychology behind. So what the way he's teaching that course is he does like the first half of the course is a true finance course. We've talked about teaching finance as a course. And what we've discovered is when we look at it, it kind of gets boring really quickly. It, it, it feels more like accounting. Um, in terms of there's just like more like just math for math sake and you just kind of do sort of, so we just get bored with it. So Tristan came up with this idea to bring in the behavioral aspect to it, which is the psychology of markets, which is really cool. Um, and so that becomes like, the, that's our new course. Um, he offered it for the first time this semester. It was 24 students took it. Um, there were 35, I think, on the wait list who wanted to take it. So this course is going to be a, 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 a linchpin going forward. There are ways to do financial things um, without having it as a minor per se. So we have, um, we have the, there's a program that we do for sophomores um, that is the finance scholarship program. And what we do is we take students who are, think they're interested in finance and we bring you to New York City over spring break. And you get to meet with all our alums who are in finance. And one of our trustees is actually work, works in finance and is, is very big on this. Um, there's a course during Paideia where we teach you kind of the basics about finance for three days before you go on this trip. And then we talk about you go on this trip, you meet all the different people in New York City, and then you come back. So there's, there's that program to kind of get people into, who think about finance into, into that. We have had students um, who have also worked on trying to get into the finance world um, kind of directly. And so that's, if you know that's something you want to do, we have success in doing that. What it means is that you have to be ready to start in your sophomore, as a sophomore, to think about how you want a place for that sort of thing. Um, so it takes a little bit of time to be ready for that. But if you, I would say the big thing is for those who want to do finance, let your advisor know early that I'm thinking finance and I want to try to figure out how to do that. Because we can totally do that. We have an investment club they get um, a certain percentage of the endowment and they get to play with it. Uh, so we have ways for you to build the finance credibility to be able to be competitive in that sort of world. We just need you to tell us that that's what you want to do. And I would say in general, when it comes down to kind of career paths and study abroad or anything else, you got to communicate with us. The more you communicate with us, the better we can kind of help you kind of fix things together and get you to where you want to go. We just can't read your mind. So as long as you just tell us, um, we're pretty good about that. Um, Somebody else asked, okay, how does studying for the LSAT work um, while working on their thesis? Um, a lot of people do it. Uh, I would say that is not, in, that, don't worry about that. Um, from the standpoint of, um, usually you study for the LSAT in the late summer, early fall. Mm -hmm. And so your thesis really hasn't taken off yet. You're in, the, you're in what I call the flailing mode of your thesis which is, what do I want to write about? Do I really want to write about this? Am I sure I want to write about this? So you're doing a lot of reading. You're like, maybe I'm going to change my mind. Maybe, you know, I can't tell you how many times people change their mind in the first three or four weeks because they keep, just keep reading and reading and reading. And that's exactly the time when you're studying for the LSAT. So those two kind of, the timing actually works really well. So the thesis is not this, oh my God, I can't do this while I'm doing LSAT. Like I'm going to freak out. I have tons of people doing that. And I think Chris has too. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about that at all. That's something that is totally manageable. Um, what I will say is just spend your summer a little bit prepping for the LSAT and then you'll be totally, you'll be totally fine. So I, I wouldn't worry about that and say, I can't do both together. 
we have a lot of people who do both together, so that's not a concern. Yeah, just to um, second that, I would just say I think most of the LSAT prep occurs during the the summer. Um, one of the you know the advantages to read is that you you are usually it's very rare for our students to take any kind of summer coursework, and that's not built into our curriculum. Sometimes maybe you have to once in a while, but ultimately that means that you can do things like take internships or um, study for the LSAT. And the you know the uh, as I said, I've been here for a long time. I haven't really and I've had a lot of advisees, both of us have a ton of advisees in comparison maybe to other departments. It's, again, it's worth noting that these majors, we're not like, you know, trying to tout ourselves here, but these majors are yes, pretty are. popular in comparison to, yeah, okay, fine. We are really amazing, uh, kind of a big deal. Uh, but we have uh, our majors, we have a lot, of, a lot of majors, so we see a lot of students and I have never had a student say, wow, you know, coursework is really getting in the way of my LSAT prep. I have never heard that. Um, and we've had students who've gone on to pretty well they've gone into frankly a, a nice range of, of, of law schools um, but they've also gone on to some really prestigious law schools in fact one of our students from a couple from I guess four or five years ago now he went to I don't know Princeton yeah one of the I'm sorry I'm not an east coast guy I'm from Montana so like it all blends together in my head but a prestigious school out there um, and then he ended up clerking for the Oregon Supreme Court out here uh, so it's a um, after you know going to read to begin with so we've I don't think the LSAT prep is, I mean, it's a big deal for sure. It's an important test and all those kinds of things, but I don't think that your thesis is going to get in the way of it. And the other thing I would say too, is the law schools know us pretty well, um, both in econ and poly, they know us pretty well. So I, I've, in the past couple of years, I've sent people to Penn, um, GW, um, Yale um, is our joint student, um, went to Yale. Um, so there's a lot of sort of aspects there. So that's, so I think we, we are well positioned to place well in addition. Um, so besides the fact that you have to do the LSAT and all that sort of stuff, you're gonna do well in the LSAT because you went to read, like, we, like they go together. And then they know who you are, they know where you went, they know what you're capable of. Um, we have reputations at these places and you're gonna be fine. Um, so if law school is a thing you wanna do, like we're, we're a good place for that sort of stuff. Connections to inter international work and policy. So I, I guess, um, I'm trying to figure out what exactly you would want out of that. So let me, let me give you one example um, from econ that we do that. Um, so there is a program called SOIL. I'm going to link back to ES at the same time. So we have an alum who started um, a program in Haiti, um, which is basically doing compostable toilets. And we send students there every once in a while. Um, I had one student who worked there in Haiti for a year right after the earthquake um, and was busy working on aspects of that. Um, we have students who have interned at the WHO, um, so World Health Organization, so policy in, in that sort of realm. Um, we don't really place so much in like IMFE sort of stuff, if, you know, International Monetary Fund or UN sort of things, if that's kind of what you're, you're, you're thinking about. Um, but I do have a colleague, a, a student who works for CARE um, and her job was to work for Kenya. Um, and then she had to switch from Kenya to Yemen because they were worried about what was going on in Yemen. So she's actually traveled to Yemen and done stuff um, there with the civil war going on at the same time. So we, we do have contacts. Um, again, part of that is that if you're thinking, I want to do international work, um, we can kind of think about that. I had one student who, the reason he wants to do international sort of thing, um, he ended up doing um, a master's in theological studies as a way to kind of build that. He wants to do international law eventually. And what he discovered was that in order to do international law, you need to understand international cultures and other sorts of aspects about that to really be successful in international law. So he wrote a thesis on the economics of Mormonism. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's Muslim. Um, he wrote about Mormonism because he went to Salt Lake City and was like, this is an interesting city, like I don't get it. And so his thesis was on the economics of Mormonism. Um, it was joint with, um, I brought in my friend, uh, Kristen Scheibel from the religion department. And he did this, th this thesis. He brought me some sand from, from, from the, the special dirt place in Salt Lake City about this. Um, and he turned that, he's now a master's student in theological studies at Harvard. Um, and he's gonna use that to launch into international law um, at some point later because he thought that was important. So we do have kind of these sort of kind of aspects out there. Again, it, it what I would say is, is for all these sort of things, it's more about like when you come to campus, like have a conversation with us. Like, what are you thinking about? Like, and we'll figure out a path. But the, the thing is, is that we've got to be able to talk and know what the path is so that we can plan it early. And we have ways to plan all sorts of things. Um, we can be really creative. Chris and I in particular are very creative in that sort of way. And you just have to let us know what you want. Um, 
and then Reed will figure out a way to get there. And part of my job as an advisor, and I think Chris is very much in the same school, part of our job as the advisor is to help you, is to both advocate for you throughout Reed, but also help you figure out where you want to get to and kind of come up with plans for how to do it. Um, so if law school is a thing, we'll plan it out. If grad school is a thing, we'll plan it out. If you want to work for international organizations, we'll figure it out. If you want to do nonprofits, we'll figure that out. If you want to be governor someday, we'll give you a plan. Um, we'll figure those things out, but we have to kind of, you have to kind of communicate to us what you want. Um, and that's really your role between you and the advisor is to make sure the advisor is aware of what you want to do. And then we'll kind of figure it out. And what I tell people in econ is, you know, maybe I'm not your advisor, but you have questions in econ, like my door's wide open, like come talk to me, like we'll figure out stuff. Um, and a lot of people do that sort of thing. Chris is very similar. Like you find us, we'll figure it out. Um, you know, some paths are a little more creative, uh, but we'll get there. <laughs> And I would say one other thing, uh, I know running out of time, one other thing, and that is that John is, has has provided you with this kind of very confident way of thinking about, hey, I have a plan, I have a thing I want to do, I'm going to come in and talk to John about it, I'm going to come talk to Chris about it, or other people about it. And it also could very well be that you come in and say, I don't actually know what I'm interested in doing. And yes. we can certainly, right, that's that's frankly what, I'd say the, the, the modal response for students is, I'm not exactly sure what I want to do. And so uh, I think that that's something we can also help with and be, either by frankly going with what we know or the good news is that we don't have allegiances to any particular path. We don't, we don't think of ourselves as having a specific specialization that we produce an X kind of student. We, we produce creative, interested, smart students, students that are also quite adaptable to a variety of contexts. And so that means that we can also be free to, to let you kind of discover your own path for a year or two here without having to know what you're going to do because it's kind of a rare person who knows they're going to go get a PhD from Harvard um, in political science the moment they step foot on campus. We do produce Harvard PhDs from Reed, but most students don't exactly know that. Yeah, and I, I would double up on that and say that the, you know, my main goal is always to make sure that you are happy at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, and whatever that means for you is 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 going to be different. And so again, I'm if you decide you want to be a chocolate farmer, like then let's go do it. Like and then and that's going to make you happy. Then I'm happy. Um, if you decide you want to be a PhD, then great. Then that makes you happy. I'm happy. Um, so we have no perceived you know preconceived notions of what you should be doing, um, and we're not going to force you into something that doesn't make any sense. Um, so that that is an important thing. So I guess, we, should we kick it back? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us for this past hour. Uh, and uh, you, you, you heard it straight from our resume destroyer that uh, we, could, we, could log, we could work with you, whether that's uh, teaching, scholarship, or potentially being governor um, someday. So, so I, I want to take a moment to thank you all for spending the last hour with us and, and Chris and John as well. I know there are some really, really wonderful questions that we weren't able to get a chance to and be assured that we will be, we'll reach out with you and, uh, and we'll make sure that we get those answered for you. But um, I also just, I'll, I'll, I'll end on, a, on this note, which is, I know you're, you've learned a lot about academics and, uh, and advising and so forth in the last hour. I hope you've also learned a little bit about the kind of academic community that Reed is and the ways in which our, uh, our faculty work with students and, and, and it make a really close and strong commitment to them. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's advising and it's thesis and it's also tea parties and cheese parties and getting to know each other. Uh, and and I, I offer that as something, especially for our admitted students in here, as you start to think about making that decision and where you want to go to college, um, I, I invite you to think about the, the, the work, the academics, and the majors, and the opportunities that you have. And I also invite you to think layered on top of that, the community that you'll be joining. And, um, and that, that, that is different from place to place. I hope you've gotten a chance to, to get a sense of what that would be like here, here at Reef. So, um, so thank you all so much for joining us. We'll get in touch with you if there's questions we couldn't get to, but, um, but thank you, Chris. Thank you, John. And um, uh, we all made it to Friday. So, so have a wonderful weekend, everyone. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming. Nice to see everybody.